<laughs> right, well, greetings, everybody, and uh, welcome back to the, uh, well, the start of the afternoon sessions here at the Open Sun Community Convention of 2018. Um, this panel is um, has become a kind of tradition. Uh, it started as the viewer panel, then it became beyond the viewer panel, then it became beyond the beyond the viewer panel. <laughs> Where are we going? Just add another beyond to that. Um, there are so many aspects of um, the virtual world that... Um, you know, the, the, there are the viewers and then there are the servers and then there is this sort of very grey area in the middle where they actually have to connect to each other. Now, um, I one of the guests who was going to be on this panel, um, Adam Frisby, uh, who's obviously an OpenSIM founder, but also now CEO of um, ScienceBase, uh, he's mid-transit. Um, somewhere between Australia and Hawaii, I believe. Um, so he can't make it, uh, which in a way might just be opportune because as many of you know, um, this um, this uh, conference started off with a bit of a bang uh, when uh, Melanie Milland um, announced um, um, some things to do with viewers. And um, also in a talk last week, which was summarized again, uh, recently, uh, Krista Lopez, who's on my other side here, also talks about a renewed interest in uh, the viewer tech. So maybe finally we are moving to um, something that really qualifies discussion as a viewer panel. Yes, we're back to viewers. Um, anyway, I'm going to introduce the people who are high here today uh, generally. Um, Melanie, you met this morning. She is uh, part of the OpenSIM core. Uh, she used to run a grid called Avenation, which had a separate code base, which has now been opened up and incorporated into the OpenSIM code base um, 0.9. Uh, Krista Lopez, of course, who was the inventor of the hypergrid. Um, Never to forget this, and as has been commented earlier on, and indeed uh, just in the last hour at the VIP session, you know, renewed uh, a renewed focus on the hypergrid as being open sims, kind of, I always call it, you know, the uh, killer app of open sim, though it's not really an app, it's protocols, of course. Um, so uh, welcome to both uh, Mernie and Krista. I'm also joined, um, he, he was at the um, Mr. Blue, Robert Adams, who was um, at the um, developer, the VIP session a short while ago, and um, has um, a, a fair things to say about the viewer. So welcome, Robert. And um, Singer Girl Mode. Um, Singer Girl Mode, I'm just going to um, give a bit of a different introduction because um, uh, she's doing a few different things. Um, She's a singer. Guess what? But on top of that, she's a developer of uh, 3D web worlds, as spelled with a Zeb, which is a virtual world in a web browser. And um, it's, you know, it's over a year in development now. It's great, have made great strides uh, with uh, over 30 regions devoted to art, education, writers, music, community and more. Um, now, we'll talk about this. In fact, I think we'll probably start by talking about this. Um, the web worlds have a great similarity to OpenSIM, except they're not what networked. In other words, you might be able to take. Um, we, uh, we were talking about um, Cyber Lounge here last year, where the principle being that you could say build something in OpenSIM and then just export it and stick it on the web. And although it's not connected to the hypergrid per se, um, it would be more or less a copy of the same build uh, on the web. So you might, for example, have a nightclub or something and you want to invite Facebook friends there. So you put it on a web page rather than, you know, send a link where they've got to download a client and then find a way to wherever you are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if Adam had been here, um, there would have been a, a cross connect there with uh, ScienceBase, which is built in Unity, in fact. Um, but it has a WebGL version as well as a standalone client, and it allows you to see uh, similar things in both ScienceBase and the web client. And in some cases, those spaces you're looking at were actually built originally in OpenSIM. So they were built in OpenSIM, then exported to SineWaves application then made available to science spaces web version so it's all you know there are issues here about the future of whether something that's a viewer on the web might eventually be able to communicate have the protocols to communicate with the greater hypergrid network and finally joining us um is will burns uh, will burns has been with us before um 
Well, um, let me see. I, I can never remember my, um, what do you call it, synonyms. <laughs> Here we are. Um, Wilburns is a synthetic environment, SME, with over 20 years of experience within marketing design research and the implementation for all areas of synthetic immersive environments. He is part of the IEEE Virtual World Standard Group and beyond, and he has been a defining force in the area of the metaverse with published research in Association for Computing Machinery and a contributing author for various academia. And I'm sure the list goes on, but that's where I'm going to stop or we'll be here all night. Right. <laughs> At this point, I'll just give you my LinkedIn to give everybody at this point. <laughs> just okay, say I'm also that. Yes, if, if you're in our live audience, you can click on the links. If you're watching on TV, tough. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe, I don't know, maybe they maybe the people doing the camera work at the moment can even put the links up. So I suspect there's a lot of work for them. Okay, let me start. Um, I, I'll, Will, I suggest you just sort of come in with comments as we go, because I know you have a fairly pertinent overview here and you might, like me, be able to prompt questions. I would actually like to start this session uh, with Singer Girl, because um, what... Um, what you're doing, Singer Girl, is very, it's kind of different from the main viewer trend that we'll, we'll obviously end up talking about. So maybe you'd like to, um, I know for a while um, you and were um, writing to me, you know, about getting things clear because um, Cyber Lounge, teachers thing, for example, is a totally different thing. And I believe, um, uh, is it the um, non-profit thing that um, Thinker and Melville does is also a bit different? You all sort of talk together, but your 3D web worlds, with a Z, is a very particular thing. So maybe you'd like to talk to us about it and the ways in which maybe it interlinks with OpenSim itself, i.e. for authoring. Sure, sure. Yeah. Happy to. Hello, everyone. So an honor to be here with you today. Uh, 3D Web Worlds, first of all, Thinker Melville does work with us, and we're honored to uh, have that participation. So thank you, Selby. Um, 3D Web Worlds is a virtual world in a browser. Um, basically, we can take builds that we make in OpenSim and put them on a web page. Uh, and in reference to how we can use that uh, with OpenSim is if you are a grid owner, we could perhaps uh, duplicate your welcome region put it directly on your website and uh, teach people through a 3D environment how to actually join you on the grid. We've done that with uh, Bill Blight's OpenSim.life and Inspiration Island. There's a tutorial where you can walk through and learn how to download the viewer. Uh, the beautiful thing about the virtual world in the browser is that there there's no download and no plugin required. Uh, we actually have two portals. Uh, we have 3D Web Worlds, uh, which is 3dwebworlds.com, as it's listed there, and uh, also uh, 3dportals.com, which I'll put both those links up in just a moment. And 3dportals.com uh, does not require any login at all. There is no avatars and no social tools. If you choose to log in as a guest or a user on 3dwebworlds.com, you do have the avatar uh, social tools, you can customize yourself, you have a profile, uh, you can chat with other users, you can teleport other users and things like that. And uh, to uh, Robert's point, yes, Robert and I work closely and I've always enjoyed that. Uh, he's he's done some great work. He actually has a couple of regions up on 3D Web Worlds, uh, full, sc full scale ores that have been converted, which was awesome work. Thank you, Robert, for that participation. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Sally Davis. Uh, I don't. I saw that she was having trouble with her audio. But one of the things that we really concentrate on, uh, in addition to the arts, is education. And uh, having an educational background myself, one of the things that I wanted to make sure 3D Web Worlds um, highlighted was the fact that we could have immersive classrooms. And we could have immersive classrooms where specific pages were embedded on websites. Uh, we do have a working chalkboard. We have a working test system. Uh, we've come quite a long way. So if any of you educators out there want to give it a shot, uh, you know, tap me on the shoulder and we'll get you set up with some of those tools. Uh, would love some of that feedback. Um, so we're, we're expanding every day. Great. Uh, something I, um, I have always... Um, started wondering about um 
you know, this goes beyond servers, the web and viewers, really. But um, was the idea, you know, we don't have a platform compatibility between something like um, Science Space built with Unity, uh, OpenSim built with, you know, like, um, <laughs> uh, Linden Prims <laughs> inherited or something, um, or indeed um, other engines and stuff like that. But I, I've always sort of thought of the idea of, you know, um, it, let's say you can um, build something in OpenSIM, where it compact it and then export it as an array of file, but somehow have things in the build they independently cross communicate. Now, presumably, something like voice is an ideal thing where you could have the in world voice in a, um, an open sim venue, duplicate in, um, in a web world that's actually a duplicate of the open sim uh, um, venues. So the venues would look the same, though they wouldn't be on the same world, so to speak. But things uh, like the voice channel or things like that could be integrated so that they're on both. Uh, there is a voice channel, correct? Um, right. Yeah. So, so we do we import the builds. There are some uh, differences about the builds. We uh, to get technical, we leave out any windows that need to be transparent. We have to add those as separate trims. Right. Uh, the reason being is because we export from Open Simulator as a Colada. Uh, yeah. And then we actually take that extra step and convert it to a GLTF. Uh, WebWorlds right. will take a Colada, but GLTF uh, loads faster and uses fewer browser resources. So the browser likes it better. So if you, especially if you have a large right. region, you want to uh, take every effort to make sure that the load is small. Sure. And uh, uh, yeah, classrooms are an ideal example, of course. So because often on OpenSim, they're run... They're off the hypergrid anyway. They're run behind closed doors because, I don't know, the kids are underage or something like that. Um, also, uh, I mean, Avacon's own grid has um, Rockliff's library on it, for example. And I imagine something like a library would lend itself to having an incarnation in a world, but also we having an incarnation that's just on the web for people that want to go to the library. We do actually have a, a writer's section that is quite successful. We have a writer's group that meets in 3D Web Worlds every Wednesday night. Right. Uh, there, there is a library and, and a bookstore in development for them. And also um, Selby and Thinker, uh, Melville, and the Monday writing group have been working on creating a quest. We actually have the ability to land in the region where a quest begins, and the user must then follow the clues. And the clues can either be just information or uh, we have it where they sometimes they might have to answer a question to get the next clue. So that that was one of our most recent updates, and we thank the Monday Writers Group for joining us. I see Bill Blythe is commenting on in chat here about shared voice and stuff. Uh, the other thing, um, I think it's back in the days of I, I was working with a uh, Tree TV in uh, Second Life, and um, we we had a way. Well. They had a way, I should say. <laughs> I don't know how it worked. Of, I, I think it involved a sort of connection with IRC, but it meant we were actually able to chat from Second Life into um, other servers and stuff and relay the chat about. So right. this is text chat, of course, rather than voice. So I think those can be sort of connected to. Right. Bill, Bill and I work closely. Uh, OpenSim.life, which is as grid as my home grid. Right. And so we are constantly uh, working on updates and how to connect the two worlds. While web world, 3D web worlds can stand on its own, one of my main interests was to connect those millions of users out there that when you say virtual worlds or eyes roll in the back of their head they don't yeah. really understand what you mean so this was kind of like a soft transition so we've been working on those kinds of things as well as um, a doorway that would be an easy entrance point that does the downloads for them uh, and then also bill has been working on a uh, a fork of the viewer that also allows you to see the web world inside uh, open sim so you could put a media oh. on a prim and actually move around the web world <laughs> yeah, I, so, keep, I keep trying to do that to a little avail. <laughs> right whenever you need something right. whenever you really need something outside the box yeah you know you call bill blight yeah. or, pretty, uh, or, or robert adams to my left i must say yeah, it's funny because, um, uh, uh, you know, we we are also in another way talking about worlds within worlds here. You know, I like the idea of being in a virtual environment in an all-inclusive world like the hypergrid and then seeing the web and things from inside it. So, of course, the first thing I do is, you know, can I put web worlds or science space on a print? You know? <laughs> right. Well, kind of, and, kind of, um, sorry, yeah. go ahead, Mel. 
Yeah, well, so I think the, I think the the real message always I'm meant to be thinking the other way around. <laughs> but, <Right. of> course, <laughs> well, but I don't, you know. Kind of the idea was so that no matter where you were on what device, if there was a classroom or an event inside OpenSim and you were on a phone and only had access to a browser, that you could still attend and everyone would be able to talk and chat and and commune with each other. So you you and I are on the same page with that. All right, Bill, Bill is also mentioning Discord, of course, but um, I'm holding back on um, uh, 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 the use of Discord channels, which has <laughs> grown recently. That, uh, Discord's not a viewer, but we will be talking on that tomorrow on the Hypergrid panel because it's, um, you know, it's one of the other ways people on the Hypergrid can communicate in parallel. Right. With the, the uh, world. Discord is a great option. It does require yeah. you to have a Discord account and a separate login. So yeah, we, we've been actually, off on that too. With the decline of Skype, I'm surprised everybody hasn't got Discord by now. Anyway, moving on, um, I'm going to cross over to Will um, just to go get you in before we move on. Um, have you any thoughts on that? Because obviously the, your your focus is on the overview and interoperability and things, and we're we're talking about parallel strands, sort of connecting, right, right. saying a web world and in world. Have you got any? thoughts or designs on that or well, do you have a feel for anything that might be changing in that direction with multiple platforms well, believe it or not <clears throat> believe it or not i don't really crap on all virtual worlds like i see the bigger picture but yeah. i also see how everybody else's stuff actually matters like a web worlds personally i don't like them but it's because i'm more high end you know i like the big big stuff right uh, but i also know that web worlds yeah, do play a purpose they play a very important purpose, which is they have to play the lowest common denominator because of browsers. But that's fine because for their use case, they are uh, filling that use case where students have to come in and do things in a simple manner. And they don't have you know, the complexity and high-end stuff, which is fine. Mm -hmm. And the same way I can see that about how OpenSim has that effect as well. So I think, they all, uh, I think when you go into virtual worlds, you have to start and by asking what's your end goal like are you trying to do this for millions of people you know are you trying to be the mainstream or you, you know, what's your end goal here and if your end goal is you're looking for something that's easy for students to use can access it from almost any device and you've hit your goal like you've you've hit your mar market even if it's a niche market it doesn't matter if you're mainstream it just matters if you've uh, supplied that goal if you've offered that uh, solution, right? So right. I say the same thing all the time to Adam. You know, if Adam was here, he'd probably be rolling his eyes at me, but I say it all the time <laughs> yeah. to him. I say, I say I, I'm not a big fan of sine wave, but it's also because I don't have it. I have a different goal in mind for the bigger yeah. picture. I say, but what he has is a great use case, right? It, it caters to a specific niche. It does it exceedingly well, and that's all that really matters. You know, I only take issue with virtual worlds when people say, let's make this into a mainstream thing. Then I start pulling everybody back and go, you don't want to do that. Maybe you don't because maybe you're not ready for that. Or maybe, you know, you need some changes or whatever, which is why I was at the uh, the code yes. thing here earlier. I was yeah. saying, saying, break it, you know, by all means. Don't live in a it's shadow of SL, break like, it. <laughs> it's rather like this thing we had a few years ago right. of, um you know, things starting up, even sort of like services like Twitter and sort of, you know, they're six months in, they're becoming successful and they suddenly realize they've forgotten one thing. Scale, right. scale, 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 you know. That's something I told, well, it's something I told uh, uh, Philip Rosedale in 2005 and he, yeah. his, his historic answer was, I beg to differ, and we all know how that worked out. Yeah. And I said something similar uh, when I was up in Linden Lab uh, last summer talking to Abby out in his office and one of the things I brought up to him I said who's I said whose bright idea was it to let on live walk in here and then walk out he goes, what do you mean? he goes what do you mean I go they come in here with a streaming technology and nobody thought to incorporate that like you let them just walk I, out he's I, like, he's I, like what <laughs> uh, I, I'm sorely Tempted, though sadly we what? don't have time. I'll have to get, get you on one of my shows. But I want to ask the question is um, Samsung appears to have failed oh God. <laughs> fairly uh, miserably, but, and now they're moving to Steam. Are they really serious oh that they're going to get, get taken? My favorite quote from that when that was announced by uh, uh, Wagner on his blog, I said, I said uh, they're going to get eaten by a shark. Because if yeah. you think we're bad, if you think we're bad and give you, you know, constructive criticism, the public's not going to be so nice. They're going to tear you to shreds. Yeah. But um, 
you know, but then you see back to the original point, you know, after that conversation, uh, if you notice, they're actually looking for streaming people now. They're looking for people yeah. to do that now. So, you know, whether I had any effect on that or whether I had enough sense to not, you know, smack them upside down and go, what were you guys thinking? Like, get on that. I think, I think it just seems to be a typical case of like a bit, late on, on the, a, a bit late on the job, you know, days of Philip well, being late, ahead of the curve are gone. Better late than never. <laughs> Better late than that. Well, yeah. like I said, it's, it's all about we will see. Cases, you know? Yeah, we will see anyway. Um, I mean, I'm like you. I mean, yeah, I just, uh, you know, I try to take a greater view. Um, you know, I call openness in my home or the hypergrid in my home. But, you know, I've got accounts on high fidelity, science based and other places. And I hop in to those two quite a lot and other places from time to time. So, you know, but let me move on now to uh, the greater thing. Obviously, Will and Singer Girl come in here if you have any comments on this. Um, at the opening part of this conference, uh, Melanie, Melanie Milan sitting next to me on my let me see left yes uh, yeah, my left my left you're right um, uh, sort of dropped her bombshell about um, uh, some work that's been done that she's done in the Unreal Engine uh, toward uh, building a new kind of um, interface uh, for OpenSIM now. Um, there were a couple of hiccups when she announced it because I saw people in the audience suddenly thought, oh, you're building, you know, <laughs> you're giving up over sim and making it an unreal thing. But this is not the this is not true. Uh, what Manny is open sourcing is components for a user interface and an actual viewer that have been built using the Unreal Engine. It's not an unreal world she's promoting, that will still be our regular open sim uh, hybrid grid. It is simply a viewer with enhancements um, that will be built or hopefully completely built, um, you know, using um, uh, the Unreal Engine. And Krista, um, coincidentally, has also uh, spoken recently about um, refocusing on the viewer side of things. And of course, as we know from the hybrid grid and everything else, Krista's core thing <laughs> is the code you know um as she says um you know she's lost when it comes to the graphics and the visual appearance of things you know it's the code that makes it work that's her forte was what melanie is contributing to what it is to my mind um a very the opposite side of the coin which is the visual impact so um christy you were there this morning and you heard melanie's um um announcement i'd like to actually start with you because i i remember at the time you had quite a few things in chat um are you impressed or have you are you suddenly invigorated with ideas as a result of melanie's announcement oh yes so i knew about uh, melanie's work for for a while she she had talked to we had talked about it before but uh, she was doing it in in you know closed source because it, it was a uh, for you know for some other purpose but now i'm so happy that she is going to open source it because uh you know f for those who have been paying attention i have been sort of away a little bit from open sim for personal reasons but also because i thought that about two years ago i realized that uh, the server side was mostly okay i mean we can continue to f find and fix bugs for forever but basically, the main components of the server are there for what can be done with these uh, Second Life viewers. So if we want to take the next big step is is really to develop another viewer that is going to be much better than this one. And uh, and that, but that is such a daunting task that every, every time that I thought about, you know, how do you even start? Because it's just like there's so many options, you know, and... Uh, you need you need a team of people who are motivated and will come together just like happened for on the server side and uh, so I know that there's a few of the core developers have been dabbling here on the viewer side in particular Melanie and uh, Ubit and Mr. Ro and Robert Mr. Blue uh, and uh, I you know I was hoping that at some point something would happen that um, maybe would get us all together again on the viewer side. And maybe, maybe this is it. So I'm super excited. I, I can't wait to get my hands on whatever Melanie has, has done. I'm sure it's amazing. 
Great. Now uh, I'm going to bring you in, Robert, as well, uh, Mr. Blue. Um, you uh, you were obviously at the Core Devs um, 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 thing um, uh, a short while ago, and uh, you know uh, your thing here really is viewer too, isn't it? How how do you feel about these events? You know the the fact that you know Crystal wants to go forward with the code, man is contributing particularly graphical elements, I think, into the interface that will enhance things. Um, What's your take on (laughs) the great merger, maybe? (laughs) Are you on? Is your voice active? Robert, I'm not sure. Oh, Oh, he's saying that he doesn't have voice. You didn't connect him to the... Um, Yes, sorry. Yes, um, I think there must have been a mistake at the beginning. He didn't get added in. I'm, I'm um, hopefully Joyce or somebody. I've I've actually pressed ring to try and add him into the call. Um, okay, <laughs> that's not going to be helpful. That was a bit of an oversight. We normally check this before we go on air. Um, okay, I I'm actually trying to add you in myself. Robert, but I think it's going to need Joyce or somebody on the back end to do it. And maybe I've got the wrong avatar or something there. It should be ringing for you, Robert. You might want to just check because I know you have voice on, didn't you, in the um, Q and A? So, oh no, of course that was in Will. Right. Okay. Well, uh, while I hope um, Robert can get um, some voice working here, um, let's move on. Now. Um, Manny, you kind of explained to me um, long before today, but also you explained to everybody today um, the, the sort of nature of what it was that you were contributing. These, um, the, what you're contributing has a lot and lot of work done on it, but it is in no way complete code at the moment. It is actually going to take uh, people like Krista and maybe Robert to, you know, um, examine it and see if their disciplines um, are right for, you know, working with it. That is correct, yes. Um, what we have is, um, well, as um, as it was said, it's a daunting task to um, start from it with a viewer. It would have been even more daunting if we had started with Naked OpenGL. Um, so um, the decision was uh, taken at that point to um, not try to uh, reinvent the wheel. And um, it was just, um, when we started, this was just the year that the big um, um, game engines uh, started open sourcing. Before that, there were closed source license monsters for huge amounts of money, you would get uh, very little flexibility. And then all of a sudden, the uh, game engines all went open source and Unreal was actually the first one to, to take the step, I believe. And um, shortly after that, um, Unity became available. And those were the two choices we really had at the time we started this project. So we um, settled on Unreal because uh, we were thinking that the uh, console world could potentially um, uh, be conquered by virtual worlds and um, Unity doesn't offer the console option. And said Unity um, offers a web option, but uh, WebGL has multiple times already proven to uh, not be capable of uh, rendering uh, large regions with live updates and unoptimized um, uh, objects from Open Simulator at, a, um, at an acceptable speed. So um, that was discounted. So we said we may want to do something uh, on that in a second iteration. So we um, went and used the Unreal Engine. And um, the Unreal Engine it, it has a bit of difficulty with dynamic content. And, right. Um, I should add at this point, by the way, that um, uh, Robert pointed out, and I can hear it too. He calls it over-modulated. Your audio has got a bit of, you might want to either make it less hot or move your mouse back from the mic a bit but uh, but we heard you anyway yeah anyway so um, what, I'm, what i'm saying uh, there is that yeah. um because of um the uh game engine we um only had to work on getting the content in and uh, that turned out to be uh, quite difficult because um, Unreal Engine is, as a game engine, uh, also made for pre-optimized content and baked lighting and things like this. And getting it to work dynamically uh, was a bit of a challenge. Um, I've showed this already um, this morning um, where we actually uh, had this imported and it looked quite all right, except that um, everything was inside out. 
it's not even visible in this picture, but when you moved around, it seemed to like warp in strange ways. And then we put other textures on there and um, noticed it. So um, this was um, when we finally uh, managed to get um, prims meshed and get custom meshes working in um, Unreal, which um, has a very, very limited support for um, procedural mesh. And, and no support at all for uh, mesh being uh, uploaded, imported. So um, here we had shapes correct. And um, then in the next step, we uh, got colors in. Yeah, nice. And yeah, and a final kind of fully rendered scene really there with all the. That looks pretty good. Thing. And this was yeah. uh, with textures and materials. And remember, all these are native open sim um, content. It's only the viewer. Yes, this is this, is this is this is actually Avenations Welcome Region, as it was at the time. Back in back in the day, yes. <laughs> So yes, it's it's real, actual open sim content. It's uh, prims and meshes and textures, um, just um, open sim, and uh, where this loads the geometries from an XML file because there isn't a network layer yet. This yeah. actually already loads the assets from an asset server sure. using the open sim asset protocol because it's just plain HTTP and that's good enough. Very nice. So I'm super. I'm at. super excited with this, Melanie. This is what's <laughs> at. It's uh, the yeah. Unreal Editor. You can run it inside the editor. You can compile it to be standalone. Uh, you can uh, run it with a headset, or you can run it with a uh, mouse and WASD. Mm. Uh, you can't run it in third person yet. There are also no avatars implemented. But um, one of our thoughts was to switch f away from the uh, Linden Labs avatar to an industry standard avatar that just uses yeah. the same mesh UV map, so the clothing will still fit, but uh, that actually would be uh, completely different internally um, as far as the skeleton goes and include their own uh, avination, which would make another pet okay. project <laughs> of mine that I tried to realize within the Linden Labs viewer, but didn't find much um, love and support for it. Um, um, I mean, avatar. this um, this avatar I'm wearing right now is a one-piece mesh. I mean, apart from the hand glasses, um, and busy there, uh, <laughs> lips don't move. But basically, it's in a format that I can stick in, say, Science Space or Hyperdeity or whatever. So it's the same sort of everywhere I go. But that is really a matter of uploading. That will still be a matter of uploading the avatar to open sim itself it's not as though you're going to have the avatar in the viewer is it um i don't get your question well you're saying you're talking about improving avatars but because you you are um the, this whole thing is about the rendering uh a pipeline isn't it so this mesh avatar you see me in now will still have to be an open sim it's not as though i can somehow upload a mesh avatar that becomes available in the viewer it's got to be in the world itself it has um, to be in the I'm, world itself yes but we were, yeah. going to, we were going to break away from the uh, kind of avatar that linton labs uses yeah just simply have an alternate representation that would only be visible in this viewer and um, ah, that would be uh, capable of having, um, for instance, um, uh, like be a spider, for instance, mid um, eight actual limbs. Okay, or whatever, so, whatever you so, want. You want a dragon that's six limbs for you? So you're talking about upgrading, upgrading the, the implementation of this to be more capable than what Linden Lab has. Yes, there's something called the Industry Standard Avatar, right. which is a right. package of mesh textures and animations all rolled into one that can be mm -hmm. uploaded, like for instance, to games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, um, right. Basing those, basing on those, and having those stored as assets, uh, we could uh, probably quite easily realize this because the Unreal Engine supports those natively, whereas the Linden Labs avatars would have to be shoehorned in. 
Right, right. So that makes a hell of a lot more sense, actually. So that sounds awesome. Go for it. I mean, I, actually, Will, you probably remember um, Bruce Joy from Vast Park, uh, who you know, yes. obviously. Um, yeah, at one point, he had the open, I think it was called Open Avatar Project, which you ba- you basically went and created an avatar, and um, you could download it in all sorts of formats. And it was designed to be a, a universal avatar you'd be able to use anywhere, whether it's on the yep. bottom of a web page or in virtually any game or any virtual world or as sadly of course i um, i think that's gone the by buys for now uh but it's the same idea is that you can uh, just like you go to paypal and open up a wallet you could go to a service and open up a custom avatar then they will provide the necessary for you to put the avatar just about anywhere and everywhere you wanted oh, if i could a, chime in for a second now yeah um, sure. i mean a good, i think a good example here maybe uh, for the audience would be when I come from SL to here, I export my XML for my numbers for my avatar, which is how my avatar looks the same. So I can I can export certain assets over and and pull them over and keep them universal. So I think in that aspect, using the universal avatar format for the game industry, if you can still keep those sort of numbers, translate them over, you'd be you'd be onto something. Oh, Maybe if numbers, you had the numbers aren't really. Um... The 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 the, the, sta- the industry standard avatar in games, the uh, industry standard uh, actor, it doesn't have morphs. It doesn't have these numbers. Right. It's but the there's mesh, other. There's... It's the mesh you make it offline. Oh wow, this should be interesting. I mean, if you're looking at it from a game, if you're looking from a game point of view, uh, I think it was, <laughs> I think it comes down to what what's your end goal for. I mean, if you're looking well, for see people going into the Unreal store and um, buying themselves one? It's not like they're that horribly expensive. Um, yes and no. I think I think if you step back from, from a developer kind of, of mindset, like, for example, is today I, you know, had no problem just uploading this hat. You know, I had it on the back up on the server for mesh and stuff, but the average person would not know what the hell they're doing. You know, yes. like finding hair, yeah, you know, finding hair or whatever. You know, the average person does not get to do all this stuff. They're not going to jump through those hoops. The other question is, do you want to homogenize the experience? Um, I mean, it, it, I'm not saying it's bad or good. I'm saying it depends on what your what your end goal is. If you're going for you know more um, cross platform aspects, then by all means, go for it. I mean, it depends okay. on what what the goal is. We, um, it's a shame actually, we haven't been able to get Robert um, on voice for some reason here. He's just actually mentioned in chat that, um, oh, it goes scrolling fast, doesn't it? The GL, uh, oh, hang on, I'm gonna have to scroll back here. Um, oh, I've lost it. The chat here moves too fast for me. Um, GL, GLTF, that's right yeah he's saying that is why that is um that is um so adaptable because it's a mesh that contains all these different elements that makes it adaptable all over the place basically um okay um i've got a horrible feeling i'm looking at the tick 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 clock and of course so it's um am i looking for the quarter past or the half past i can't remember (laughs) um I'd like to just go back quickly to Singer Girl because, um, uh, the, the, um, Singer, what um, what are your feelings? I, I presume you did hear Manny's announcement this morning and what Chris has been saying. Um, as a developer in general, um, are, you, are you excited by all this? Do you see potential for it? Oh, absolutely. And I, I'll, I'll also refer back to Robert's comment at the Q&A that, uh, you know, revolutionary or evolutionary, and uh, it looks like the advancements oh. coming forward are going to be more revolutionary, which um, I think is is fabulous. It's, it's kind of what <laughs> what we're trying to do with with our new thing is is uh, you know change, take take what's good from the old, but build upon it and build something better. Yeah, exactly. It, it's funny. My my head can't correlate this revolutionary evolutionary thing. I don't see why something can't be revolutionary and evolutionary. But. Well, you take you take the, the you take the the good from the old stuff. Exactly. But sometimes yeah. it's better to start over and pick and pull the the good stuff as opposed to building on top of it. Yeah. 
Okay, um, so I'm just testing uh, seven minutes remaining. Uh, that was at 13.13. What is it? Oh, okay. I've still got, se still got seven minutes remaining, I'm told. Okay, I'm not in such a panic anymore. Right, okay. Um, so, uh, the future. Now, um, uh, something I was going to ask, so I might as well ask it now so we can have got a bit of time, is... Um, Obviously, somebody like Will takes the, the, the big picture here and common protocols and things. Now, I always kind of wondered if one day we might have what would be called a metaverse viewer, which somehow will be able, um, will be a single viewer that will somehow be able to connect to different platforms and interpret their content and still be able to render it. So you might have a viewer that could render Unity content and then immediately render Unreal content and then maybe <laughs> immediately render OpenSim content too. Now, I imagine that is miles and miles away. I mean, this this is a major step. Um, well, yes and uh, no. It, because yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm have, going with that one, yes here. and no. Is we have a viewer that can render meshes, textures, um, and SL primitives, and um, we have a world that contains the actual um, data. Now, yeah. uh, for any other world, it's the same thing, unless you're talking about having a, um, a DLC package, like with a game, where yeah. the um, stuff is actually downloaded onto the user's computer and then used from the local hard disk. As long as we're talking about streaming content, yeah. um, I don't really see why there should be any content that we can stream, provided that the uh, people who are streaming the content uh, will open their formats to us. Yeah, in other words... The, the button that's the big if in the room dudes. yeah um i just wonder i think it's going to be a few years yet before things pan out but i'm looking at um I, i'm looking at what's happening with um sansa linden lab for example it clearly i mean it's got hardly any users they keep trying to hype it up and make esports things but nobody apparently has ever logged in and um g going on steam i think you know <laughs> steam's for gamers isn't it that's the last place people you know sounds like has no gaming no well, no real gaming side to it and i i i, I think you know, um, that will disappear from our radar, especially as um, I, I think probably Linda has made a very big mistake in trying to launch a new world and not only build a new world for themselves, but also build their own authoring engine. Um, other people um, see the future and uh, whether you like it or not, um, Unity, Unreal and some other gaming engines have, uh, I won't say monopoly, but they, they are dominant in, in, in this world. And, but, that, in a sense, has an advantage because the similarities may actually allow for collaboration and interoperability at some future point. Um, let's say you've got two completely different virtual worlds built with Unity. Technically, they could tweak each other to become, an, you know, an interoperating a duo of worlds but Sansar could never have done that because it's 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 fundamental system is alien to everything else um and uh presumably the same applies with the unreal engine you know two two um worlds or something built with the unreal engine i'm not talking about this viewer here i'm talking about generally the worlds then two worlds built with that engine might find ways to interoperate, whereas they don't at the moment because they're being marketed as separate entities. At some future point, they may need to become attached to a kind of metaverse or something, and the commonalities of the engine underneath them may be the thing that empowers that. Um, well, um, yeah. again, yes and no. It depends on how these worlds are built. If the worlds stream their content, then uh, theoretically anything uh, that can, that they can stream, we can convert and display. It may just be more or less effort, and we need to have the protocols. But most of the worlds, but say most of the games, even multiplayer games that are built on uh, a specific engine, use downloadable packs where you download the entire pack, like um, uh, like on Blue Mars where you had to download the entire region and then have yeah. it locally. And uh, those formats would potentially be incompatible or proprietary and yeah. uh, definitely not easily shared between engines. 
uh, the, like the DLC format that uh, the Unreal Engine uses um, is a um, VFS, a stackable VFS, quite uh, involved. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think we use it in this viewer. Um, please don't. Please don't start using that. <laughs> please and, don't. Um, uh, most game engines are based on a VFS, actually. Uh, so that DLC uh, can uh, override uh, content that came with the game. Yeah. I, it's it's darn difficult, isn't it? I mean, we all also think what the um, what are the obstacles we get. Um, I'm going to come back to Open Sim again here. Now we're talking about you know how well the hybrid grid is great, but you know maybe the groups and the 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 messaging across grids doesn't work. You know we can jump you know with a click, but we can't text with a click across the grids. Um, but also things like inventory, for example. At the moment we're moving it with us from server to server, aren't we? If I understand it, is um, I, I presume some some of it sort of caches in an unreadable form in our in our system but basically we're not talking about you know downloading our inventory to our local disk you know it's um it's a, a thing that's constantly moving around and if there are any uh, you know security problems it's because it's presumably constantly moving with us um as you know as we uh, uh, travel from place to place um Inventory if, is actually server side, and it's yeah. not moving with you from region to region, but uh, rather you're accessing the inventory server from each region that you move into. Um, yeah. However, anything you pull out of the inventory becomes part of the region, and um, yeah. uh, it would then then be deleted and um, re re serialized back into your inventory if you pick it up again. Um, the yeah. issue here more is more one of um, uh, control and um, monetizing content and anything else. If you could save something to your local computer, obviously uh, permissions would become meaningless because you just make multiple copies of that file and then start selling the copies, even though you yeah. may not be allowed to. So uh, the original decision um, by uh, Linden Labs that uh, is the core of uh, the inventory system as we have it today is that uh, users cannot save anything locally. Later viewer developers after the um, uh, viewer um, became well understood added the feature of exporting things that they um, actually don't own. Um, everybody knows about those viewers. There is, I, I must admit, I'm uh, hopeless on the tech side of this. There's a lot of talk of, you know, blockchains and stuff like that for registering assets and wallets and stuff like that. I know uh, High Fidelity were looking at that a little bit, but I was reading up recently, and I don't know whether it's connected or not, but the... Um, uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee has taken time off from all these other sort of things these days to work um, for a few months on um, re-decentralizing the web. You know, it's not so much building a new web, but re re decentralizing god is a tongue twister uh what uh what's there already and i noticed in the details there there's a notion of this thing um basically called a pod that will contain all your assets your identity um almost anything you want like you know your maybe your credit cards your health stuff um but also all your online stuff and whatever but it would be sacrosanct in other words it, it's like walking around with an id card that only you can program uh, rather than an id card that somebody else supplies you which is pre-programmed with information you've already given them so they've got your information and it sounds to me that this new system would involve having um a, a, a you know a really locked down kind of container which i think is called a pod at the moment which um is totally secure and you will put information into it and you will have total and utter control over how much information is released out of it to any party you're dealing with so it would be an end of data mining and facebooks and stuff like that which i think is rather a good thing um you know do you do, do you see our assets in uh, open sim or virtual worlds maybe uh, moving in that direction and i'll put this as an open question and i think it's going to be the last look at the clock <laughs> I see it probably. I mean, I'm not going to say yes or no. I think it's a possible solution, but it still needs to mature. 
There's oh, yeah. things like Zaya, there's like things like Zaya.io that do that are doing that now. They're, they're applying that in a bigger way, and I'm excited for it. But I'm also stepping back and saying, well, is this you know it needs to be proven. It needs to actually you know field test that before I jump on board. Yeah. But I'm I'm happy about it. It's a good I did, idea. I did I did feel that when you know. Uh, uh, so Tim is, you know, father crazy on the internet, isn't he? Or, or, or that's the way he's described, you know. Although the web, in fact, is what we're talking about. Right. Um, you know, his involvement on that level. The, it, the whole project is called Solid, I believe. And um, you know, I, I, it just strikes me that when somebody like a, the originator, like him, gets involved, you know, it's going to stand yeah. a chance of exposure at least, you know. Yeah, when he jumps in okay. and starts saying, okay, what the hell did you guys do to my creation? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's so, time you know, to start thinking hey, about this what's is going my, on. Yeah, hey, this is my baby. What are you done to it? Damn it. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's, to- there, you know, there's, there's several um, uh, challenges in, in that kind of architecture. And, it, 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 uh, you know, when, when we were designing the hypergrid, there, there were a couple of possibilities uh, especially if we own the viewer side, then the possibilities would even be more real. With without changing the viewer, there were only so much that we could do. But uh, but you know the the idea of where the where are your things? Where are your personal things? They can be in your computer, and that sounds great. But you have to keep in mind that you, you use many computers. You, yeah, you, oh, know, yeah. you use a home computer and you use a work computer and the laptop and whatnot. And that now what? Suddenly, if you want to access your own things, then you, you have to have some sort of networking among all your personal machines. And yeah. now we're getting into things like, uh, you know, uh, syncing the data in somehow. And, and if, you, if you push that to the end users, I, I think that... We lost voice. (coughs) Oh, right. We lost Krista's voice and we got a very heavy cough. What's all this about? He asks. We do need to Um, wrap though. Yeah, I, I, okay. Uh, yeah, very uh-huh. good. Okay, right. Okay, well, it's, it's the, the, the problem with these panels. They start to get really interesting, and the longer they go on, the better and heated they get. And then suddenly somebody pulls the plug because you had the time. But that is uh, that is what happens here. I'm Sorry, I, I, I'm back. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> we're at the end of the, are we at the end of the session? We are, yes. but you can wrap up quickly if you want. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, I just realized it's almost one thirty here. Yes, exactly. There's never enough time, especially when you get towards <laughs> the end. Uh, so uh, my apologies to Robert Adams, who we pulled in at the very last minute, and he's been wonderful in chat, but um, we didn't get his voice working, so that's unfortunate. Um, I'd like to thank Singer Girl Mode. Uh, thank you, Singer Girl. Uh, good luck with 3D Web Worlds, and um, thanks for letting us know all about that. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Will Burns um, uh, for his insights and such. Thanks, oh, Will. It's a pleasure. Right. Uh, of course, I would like to thank Krista Lopez. Uh, Lopez, you, you can't have an open CMO have a good panel without her, in my opinion, but there we go. Thank you, Krista. <laughs> thank you. And finally, I'd like to thank Melanie Milland, who was our real surprise, um, uh, well, surprise at the beginning of the conference, and she was surprised on this panel too. So thank you, Melanie. Well, thank you.